so in the last class we were doing polar decomposition and you saw that the deformation gradient tensor f could be written as either big r into u or as big v into r and u is square root of c which is square root of f transpose f and then for c we use the eigen decomposition and said it is equal to i equal to 1 to 3 lambda i square of vi tensor product vi okay where vi's are the eigenvectors and lambda i square is the eigenvalue so this is the eigenvalue and this is the eigenvector so you have to get eigenvalues and eigenvectors and then you can do this eigen decomposition and in the coordinate system of eigenvectors the c matrix becomes identity and u which is square root of c then simply becomes i equal to 1 to 3 lambda i of vi tensor product vi see it's a square root so the this coefficient simply we have to take the square root okay so that's how you get your u and big v likewise becomes i equal to 1 to 3 of lambda i into big r little v i tensor product big r little v i okay so that's a recap and so having done this let us also try to have some physical intuition of this of this decomposition f equal to r into u or v into r so can you recall your polar decomposition sorry your composite deformation so if you have two deformations f1 and f2 so if you recall if your f is equal to f2 composite f1 then the deformation gradient total big f was big f2 into big f1 isn't it so so looking at this and further comparing with this decomposition what we see is that if we say that f is equal to ru then it means that you know you first deform the body according to u in the first step and the second step you simply rotate the body according to big r so this can also be thought as of as a composite deformation in the first deformation you apply big u and in the second deformation you apply big r so basically here is your body this is reference so you apply just big u to get to some state and then you apply big r to get to another state okay so that's why we were learning about that composite deformation but you see this second step big r this is not rigid rotation it is not not a rigid rotation can anyone tell why it is not a rigid rotation anybody
because sir yeah tell me hello sir yeah yeah please tell sir uh, because this is uh, occurring inside the body so uh, means like it is not ro rotating uh, the body which uh, the deformation which is occurring inside the body if you take element it will uh, deform and then rotate means like total deformation okay i understand so the first thing u is deforming the body because you know u has u is equal to square root of c right and c has got the information of stretch longitudinal stretch as well as shear strain suppose c is equal to identity then u becomes identity right and in that case there is no strain generating in the body there won't be any volumetric strain either but then in the second step you have this big r then will you call it a rigid rotation then even for a general u what i am talking of is just the transformation from the intermediate to the final step not from the original to the final from intermediate to the final is this rigid is this rigid rotation no sir why not because sir it is occurring after the inter intermediate uh, deformation of course it is occurring after intermediate but i am just talking of from intermediate to final forget about the original suppose karo ki kisi ko pata hi nahi ki original kuch hai use intermediate configuration diya gaya aur usme big r lagana hai will you call it rigid rotation फिर आर का डिटरमिनेंट वन नहीं है शायद वन तो है तुमसे पूछ रहा हूँ different answer sir we are defining it at a point right the rotation uh, rotation tensor r so right. Uh, the deformation gradient for one point so maybe for another point is that uh, deformation map is different then capital f would also be different so maybe then r would also be different so the rigid rotation means all the points should have that same rotation right? that is true i mean how did you know this had you learned it or you just thought about it Uh, I mean, a rigid rotation. Uh, like uh, our sir had told that for rigid motion, like all the points in the body should have the same translation and rotation. But here, since we are changing it from point to point, it can differ. Correct. Yeah, I mean you are right. Very good. So what Niranjana is saying that for rigid rotation, every every volume or every you know neighborhood of a body. should undergo same rotation every part of the body has to undergo same rotation then only we call it rigid rotation see in rigid motion if you take two points in the body any two points a and b then the distance between them should not change after deformation that's called rigid rotation or rigid translation or rigid motion of the body okay and for that to hold every small volume of the body all of them should undergo same rotation but here for a general deformation 
big F will be changing from point to point and likewise this decomposition will also change from point to point and so this big R can be a function of point. So big R is not the same at every point in the body. Therefore, we can't call it a rigid rotation. Okay, so I'll just write here because big R need not be the same at every point in the body. Okay. But if we, you know, if you think of a local volume, if you think of a small volume of the body, then that small volume, you can say that this small volume, tiny volume has undergone rotation in going from intermediate to final. But every small volume is going, undergoing its own rotation. It's different rotation. So as a whole, it is not rigid but locally it is rigid so i can see it's not a rigid rotation globally but locally we can assume it to be a rigid rotation Okay, furthermore, you know, let us <clears throat> try to go a bit more deep. <clears throat> so you are at a point here. Yes, tell me. Sir, if we are assuming that each individual point is uh, shifting such that uh, there is rigid rotation, sir, then why on the macro scale it is somehow changing into a deformation case? Um, Yes, because as I told you now, different points are undergoing different rotation. Therefore, it's not a global unique rotation. Globally, it's not a unique rotation. So, so it can create deformation also. Sir? Yes. Sir, जहाँ जहाँ body में R X capital X capital Y capital Z के independent होगा, तो मतलब वहाँ पर वो हो रहा है, क्या कहते हैं, rigid body rotation हो रहा है globally, मतलब उस उस portion के लिए। अगर देखो इसी body के rigid rigid rotation होने के लिए, body के हर point पर big R same होना चाहिए, everywhere. But in this case, it is not happening here. Okay. So, it means that big R, capital X, capital Y, capital Z should be independent. There. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. So, can you give an example? I mean, which type of matrix will be seen? That somewhere it will be independent and somewhere it will be independent of the coordinates. नहीं अगर if you are asking of an example जहाँ पर rotation जो है same होता है every point in the body is that what you are asking an example where rotation is same everywhere मतलब I want to ask how we can construct a matrix R which yes symbolizes local rigid body rotation but not global okay it is very simple to think of that you know think of any um, rotation. For example, think of a rotation about E3 axis. So this big R, the matrix will be 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, then cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta and cos theta. Okay. Now, suppose you have a beam, okay, think of a beam. Okay, that's a very nice question, by the way. Which has, you know, along the axis, we have Z, 
and in the cross section we have big x and big y all right and suppose the deformation here is such that big f is equal to big r but that's a function of z which is equal to um you know maybe cos of uh, z into k minus sin of z into k 0 sin of z into k cos of z into k 0 0 1 okay well this is not the full big f but big f ka jo r wala part hai wo aisa hai aisa bhi ho sakta hai jo big r wala part hai wo is tarah ka ho okay sir so big f such that big r is of this form can you see what is this actually first of all you see this what is the angle of rotation theta that is z into k right where k is a constant k is a constant some constant and z is the coordinate so as you move along the axis of the beam the angle of rotation is linearly increasing okay can you think of such a deformation have you come across that in your UG course Torsion. As you move, yes torsion where one end is fixed exactly so this is uh, it, it does happen in case of torsion very true so torsion is such a deformation that big f is such that its big r part has got this form it also has got u but big R has got this form. All right. Is that okay with all of you? You know, I can also construct it more explicitly. This torsion, so the case of torsion, it's good that, you know, since we are just discussing, let's do it more clearly. So in case of torsion, if we use cylindrical coordinate system, we are, we are working with big R, big theta and big Z as the coordinates instead of big X, big Y, big Z. Then the small r, we can say same as big R and small theta will then be equal to big theta well i have to use something else for small theta so maybe let's say this small theta is equal to big theta plus the twist into z and that is small z is equal to big z that's the deformation and so what will be the deformation gradient then big f Can you guys think of what will be the deformation gradient? So in this case, how do we write a small x? A small x will be equal to what? So this is little r into e little r. I think I'm, I'm going a bit, uh, I'm digressing a bit. But I, I'll just write it here plus a small z e z.
and if for this particular case little r is same as big r into e little r plus small z is same as big z into e z and what is the relationship between e little r and e big r so that would be big r into a rotation tensor the one that i have written ever ever big r z into e capital r plus z into e capital z so this is the deformation map small x as a function of big r big theta and big z and from here when you find out the deformation gradient you will see that it is such that its big r has got this form okay i haven't done a very good job here but i think if i go deep then it will take a lot of time but you see the idea that i wanted to say was that rotation can vary from point to point in the polar decomposition theorem and this is one particular case the case of torsion is one particular case where rotation varies from point to point similarly in case of bending also you must have heard about bending of a beam there also the rotation varies from point to point okay all right so let me go ahead sir isme ek aur doubt mai puchna chahta tha ha puchu sir isme ek constant z par jo bhi particles hain ha wo rigid body motion kar rahe hain jo abhi aapne pehle wala example diya torsion wala that is true yes to so ye cross section constant z par jo particle hai na wo cross section form karega beam ka हाँ जी और वो क्रॉस सेक्शन जो है सिंपली रोटेट कर रहा है सो एवरी क्रॉस सेक्शन इज रोटेटिंग रिजिडली रोटेटिंग क्रॉस सेक्शन का ना तो रेडियस चेंज हो रहा है ना तो शेप चेंज हो रहा है वो बस रिजिडली रोटेट कर रहा है बट डिफरेंट क्रॉस सेक्शन आर रोटेटिंग डिफरेंटली ओके दिस इज वॉट इज हैपनिंग हियर इन केस ऑफ टॉर्सन फॉर दिस पार्टिकुलर टॉर्सन every cross section is rotating rigidly but different cross sections have different shape have different rotation and therefore this is not a case of global rigid rotation sir ye volume ke liye bhi possible ho sakta hai kya matlab like there is a particular volume inside the full yeah. big volume which is going rigid body rotation you mean some finite volume inside the big body yes not sir. a small volume ha means it is a plane so instead of a plane because yes. here the thing which is going rigid body motion is the cross section yes it's a plane right it's a finite plane finite yes, cross but you are saying that can we think of a example where a finite volume of the body yes sir. is undergoing one rotation and another finite volume of the body is undergoing different rotation ah uh, yes sir and such that the deformation is still continuous yes so sir. i can't think of it, you know over the top of my head right now maybe i'll think about it and if i come across some example i will let you know but okay. right now i can't think about it okay so let's proceed further but it was a good question yes so as i told you 
when you have to think of it through big R into U, then this part is U, and then we have big R. And of course, the body will look different. So maybe it looks like this. And in the big R part, also it is going to be different because it is not a rigid rotation. But locally, just think of a point here, capital X. And think of three lines here. which are along the eigenvectors, you know, but they are very small lines. I should have drawn the small lines only. So small lines. V1, V2, V3. And since they are eigenvectors of C, we know now that those points only stretch, isn't it? So because of U, these points will simply undergo stretching. So this becomes lambda 1 into v1. This becomes lambda 2 into v2. Whereas this becomes lambda 3 into v3. OK, so that's just due to u. And now because of r, these three lines will rotate. And such that finally it becomes lambda 1 into big R V1. And this becomes lambda 2 into big R V2. And this is lambda 3 into big R V3. Okay, so you can see now that indeed they are undergoing the three the three lines are undergoing rotation locally. It's an exact rotation so that the angle between them is indeed conjured. It's 90 degrees still. So that's the you know usefulness of this decomposition. You can break it into the deformation part, local deformation. which is responsible for stretch, shear, and volumetric strain. And then you have local rotation. OK, the another way to think of it is it first undergoes big R. And then the body is like this. And then it undergoes big V. And of course, finally, it has to look the same in the two cases. So the bottom one is the decomposition big R into big V. The top one is the decomposition big R into big U. OK, so in the bottom case, first of all, they rotate to big R into V1, then big R into V2, and then big R into V3. And then through this V, <clears throat> these ones then simply undergo stretching without any change in orientation. So this is, for example, lambda 1, big R, V1, this is lambda 2, big R, V2, and this one is lambda 3, big R into V3. Okay, is that clear to all of you? Two different ways to represent the total deformation. And this polar decomposition when we write it as big R into big U, <clears throat> it has also got an analog in linear elasticity. So this is multiplicative for finite elasticity.
and the same thing becomes additive in case of linear elasticity and you and you would see it as identity plus grad u minus grad u transpose by 2 plus grad u plus grad u transpose by 2 so this is additive decomposition where this part corresponds to rotation and this part is your small strain right so it's also called infinitesimal strain tensor okay and that's the analog of so this is the analog of this big r over here and this is the analog of this u over here okay and you can also prove it i mean i can give you a assignment but i will i will not do that you can think of it on your own okay so it just comes through linearization the multiplicative decomposition is general but if you restrict it to infinitesimal deformation the linear elasticity case you get additive decomposition all right any question till now hello sir yes sir uh, uh, in this deformation that we have seen above that uh, u and r uh, both are uh, for a, for a point in the body so we will have yes. different u and different r for different points in the body yes uh, then sir uh, in in like general general mechanics we learn that uh, for a point rotation is uh, rotation is like we cannot define for a point like what it is that's true that is true you, rotation is not for a point but here we are so defining why, yeah so that's why although its rotation is a field varying from point to point but it does not act on a point it acts on a small volume around that point so it is for a small volume very very tiny volume around the point so for those tiny for anything all points in that tiny volume around the point will undergo the same rotation i mean i should not say all points but the the volume itself the tiny volume as a body undergoes this rotation big r points never undergo rotation so it's a very good observation points never undergo rotation lines can rotate area can rotate volumes can rotate but points do not rotate sir this is the reason uh, we have defined earlier uh, deformation around a neighborhood point of a point that is true yes that is the reason correct so now okay. you know you can think that <clears throat> so yeah let me draw another picture then in fact i wanted to do that but i couldn't do it but now you because of you i now remember so think of a small volume here and it, it may have several line elements okay so because of u the line elements will change and the angle between them will, will also undergo change okay and the volume can also increase but due to r this volume will simply rotate <clears throat> okay so this volume is simply going to rotate of course i i have drawn a big volume but you have to think that it's an infinitesimal volume around the point so i'll just write here they are infinitesimal volumes so due to this big r 
the all the lines between within this infinitesimal volume they neither stretch nor change angle between them okay all that is happening just in the u part okay very good any other question no, sir for a line element yeah how do you differentiate between like shear and rotation so again you see shear is not associated with just one line element for shear you have to think of two line elements pair of line elements right okay so suppose a line element is there yes because of u it will rotate hmm. it was of u also it will rotate because of u also it will undergo change because there is shear okay and because of r also it will rotate yes but because of r all the line elements will rotate by same amount whereas because of u the line elements will all not rotate by the same amount if the line elements rotate by the same amount then the angle between line elements will not change and therefore it will not generate any shear okay sir right yes so that's also a very good point that rotation is there in u as well as in big r but the one due to big r is the same for every line element whereas the one due to big u is different for different line elements okay i ha i have a notes you know on ug solid mechanics where i talk about this uh, rotation to infinitesimal rotation and then rotation due to shear i showed how you sum them together which can answer your question more you know clearly so i'll share that with all of you okay any more question sir yes सर तो टोटल जो ओरिएंटेशन है वो भी चेंज नहीं होगा रोटेशन की वजह से एंगल भी चेंज नहीं होगा वॉल्यूम भी चेंज नहीं होगा रोटेशन की वजह से हां तो रोटेशन की वजह से सर ये रोटेशन की वजह से आई थिंक ये सारी चीजें चेंज एंगल बिटवीन लाइन एलिमेंट्स विल नॉट चेंज बट ओरिएंटेशन ये लाइन एलिमेंट विल सर्टेनली चेंज हर लाइन एलिमेंट रोटेट कर रहा है तो हर लाइन एलिमेंट का ओरिएंटेशन चेंज होगा बट रिलेटिव ओरिएंटेशन चेंज नहीं हो रहा है वॉल्यूम सर हाँ वॉल्यूम भी नहीं होगा चेंज क्योंकि रोटेशन है ना लोकल रोटेशन है तो उसका डिटरमिनेंट तो वन है तो वॉल्यूम भी चेंज नहीं आएगा लेंथ में भी कोई चेंज नहीं आएगा करेक्ट तो तीन प्रूफ हमने पहले किए थे वही इस टोटल वो के लिए भी वैलिड होंगे सर अफकोर्स अफकोर्स जी सर ठीक है हेलो Yes. Uh, hi. Yes, sir. I had a doubt that when we derive the stretching of a line element. Yes. There we had found out the the uh, F tensor as a gradient of x vector plus u vector. Say again, which tensor? F tensor. Uh, Ah uh, yes, sir. When stretching of line element, we found out at the beginning. Yeah. Like at the beginning of lecture, like we derived the uh, uh, formula for F tensor, right? We call to gradient of the deformation map is gradient of yes. x vector plus u vector. So gradient of x capital X vector plus gradient of u vector. Yes. So this yes. I plus. del uh, i plus uh, grade grad of u vector correct so so that is the same as the one you wrote here for additive decomposition right because del u we just decomposed in symmetric and anti symmetric part that so is true yes we got this in finite uh, elasticity case right like in general case itself we got this second formula okay okay very good so 
what Niranjana is saying that this decomposition is exact even for finite elasticity, isn't it? That's what you are saying, no? Because oh, yes, F, yes. F is anyway I plus grad U even for finite elasticity and grad U which is a general tensor can be written as a sum of anti-symmetric and symmetric part the way I have done here. So this decomposition holds exactly even for finite elasticity. But the interpretation is only in linear elasticity that this part corresponds to strain and this part corresponds to local infinitesimal rotation. So this interpretation is only in linear elasticity. Okay, this interpretation so we use that interpretation. Yes, correct. Oh, okay, sir. It's a very good question. Okay, any more? How it is only in linear elasticity? <laughs> what? Uh, just now which you explained. See, will you say this as a strain for finite elasticity, gradual plus gradual transpose by two? Is that a strain for finite elasticity? It is not. Is this is this blue box? Is this rotation for finite deformation? It is also not. You know, I, I'll just, uh, I mean, I'll share that, you know, a PDF with you guys and you can check it. But basically, neither this blue box is rotation for finite deformation, neither the other blue box is strain for finite deformation. They hold only in, you can say that gradual plus gradual transpose by two is a strain only for linear elasticity case likewise identity plus gradual minus gradual transpose by two you can say it as rotation only for linear elasticity not for finite elasticity. and why i mean the the second one is is clear no that gradual plus gradual transpose by two that's the strain only in linear elasticity because you neglect that quadratic term. Yes, sir. But the first term is not clear right now why it is rotation for linear elasticity. That will be clear to you when I show you that PDF. You know, you look, go through that PDF and it will be clear to you. Okay, sir. Yes. Okay, any more queries? Very good that you guys are asking. You know, another very nice interpretation, in the meantime, you think about it. They say that big F is a mixed tensor, whereas U is a Lagrangian tensor. And V is an Eulerian tensor. why it will be very clear you see what is f doing so this is reference and this is deformed so big f it takes a line element from the reference and maps it to the one in the deformed isn't it delta is small x this is delta capital x so delta is small x is equal to big f into delta capital x so big F acts on line elements in the reference configuration, which are Lagrangian. And what it gives you is the line element in the deformed configuration, which is Eulerian. So therefore we say it's a mixed tensor. And people also say that, you know, this big F has got one leg in the reference configuration and another leg in the deformed configuration. And they use exactly this word. So I'll also write it here. If you if you read, know the very 
theoretical books of solid mechanics or finite elasticity that's what they would say so it has one leg in reference configuration and another leg in deformed configuration but big u has got both the legs in reference configuration and why is it so you see this big u you also wrote it as summation over lambda i vi tensor product vi and both vi's both of them are lagrangian elements whereas for big v it is summation lambda i big r v i tensor product big r v i and both of these are eulerian elements so big u has got both legs in the reference con whereas big v has got both legs in the deformed configuration okay sir in uh, finite elasticity when you say strain it should be lagrangian strain tensor well you can also work with what is called eulerian strain tensor so how do you define strain in uh, in uh, finite elasticity like in linear elasticity we know that each of the element is either stretch in the element in that direction or change in the angle between half of the change of the angle between the two elements yeah so is it the same in uh, finite elasticity also well that is the that's what we did also no here so we found out the stretch of a line element or change in angle between two line elements or change in volume of a volume element we found formula for all of them right okay so definition is the same but the expressions will change yes exactly the physics is the same of course the physics behind the strain is the same but the mathematical expressions are different because you are not yes. neglecting anything here yes yes that's also a very good question okay so let me now move ahead um so the next thing is uh, we want to talk about what is called stress you see till now we just talked about strain but now we want to talk about stress tensor okay and all of you know from your ug course that there is something called cauchy stress tensor right which is denoted by sigma and then there is also something called traction traction vector which is basically force per unit current area i'll say deformed area and that's given by sigma into n isn't it that's the cauchy theorem and this is called t you no know, t is the traction vector so think of you know this uh, again a reference configuration which is deforming okay now think of a section here okay so i take a this body 
and I get uh, this as the area, sectional area. All right, I hope the picture is clear to you. So that's the sectional area. And you can see that this area is in the deformed configuration. This is the deformed area, right? This is a deformed area. So when I take one part of this body and right here, then this is how the section will look like. And on this section, the other part of the body is applying force, which is distributed all over this section, isn't it? And this is called traction T. And you can see it is varying from point to point on this surface, on this section. So T is not just a function of point, but also the function of the plane normal. And it is equal to the stress tensor sigma at a point X multiplied by the normal to the plane N. Okay, so sigma depends on just the point of the body. It is varying from point to point, but traction depends on point as well as the plane normal. Okay, so I hope, I think you all know about this. If you don't know, then you just have to brush it up. And then, you know, if you, let us say this area over here, maybe I should write like this. So this is that area, this purple thing. If I denote it by omega. Now that area will be something else here. No, it will not be the same area. It could be some omega naught. It's a different area here, right? Now suppose I want to find out what is the total force on this omega itself from the other part of the body. So what will the total force? That will be the force F is equal to integration over the surface area omega of the traction T, right? D small a, isn't it? To integrate that traction over the area, you get the total force. Is it clear to all of you? And you see, this is also a, this is called Eulerian integration. This is Eulerian integration. Why it is Eulerian? Because you are integrating over the deformed volume. Everything is a function of deformed coordinate here. T is a function of deformed coordinate and the deformed surface normal, isn't it? So I could also make it more explicit. This is omega, which could be changing with time, right? As the body deforms, omega will change with time. And then T is a function of X as well as the normal and also the time dA, which you could write as integration over omega t sigma as a function of x and time into n. And n is also a function of n is also a function of time. And it, it could also be a function of x actually da is that clear to you guys why is n a function of x because omega need not be planar omega can be curved also 
if omega is curved then different point on omega will have different surface normal so n can be a function of x and time both okay so let me just rewrite this thing here so f is basically integration over omega t sigma as a function of x and t into n as a function of x and t into dA. Okay, and what is to be noted here is that these are deformed coordinates, deformed coordinates, and therefore the Galilean integration. If you are not following, please ask me. Now, you know, is it possible to write this integration in terms of undeformed surface, this omega naught? So that is a question. Let me make it a bit more clear. This is like this. And then you have a dot dot dot. Okay, so what do you think? Of course, it is possible, but then we have to do some transformation, right? So right now, this is an Eulerian integration. Can we make it? Can we convert it? So that's the question. Can we? convert it to Lagrangian integral. Okay, so what should we do then? Obviously, the domain has to be omega naught, isn't it? And this will not be a function of time anymore. It's the deformed surface which is a function of time, but the undeformed surface is independent of time, isn't it? Now, what other things have to be changed? So, in the formula for sigma, you will then say that small x becomes a function of big x, comma time. And then you have a time also present here. Similarly, in the argument of normal vector small n, you will see that small x is a function of big X, comma time, and then an explicit dependence is dependent on time also. And then dA is also there. But dA has to now change somehow. You know, this is still an integration over omega only, omega as a function of time. But can you recall this NDA? This is the surface, this is deformed surface element. And we had found out the transformation between deformed and undeformed surface element, isn't it? So just remember, just recall what was that. So NDA, I think it was that F into F inverse transpose into D capital A, isn't it? And, and I, I guess there was this M also, no, this M this n okay so if it is small n then it is big n d capital a so that is what we can write here so this now becomes an integration over omega naught and sigma is then the function of small x which itself is a function of big x comma t comma t and then n d a for that we will write it as Det f 
into F inverse transpose into big N and big N is now a function of big X. Okay, let me make other things also here. So big F is function of big X comma T. Similarly, big N is a function of only big X. It's not a function of T. And you have D capital A. So please try to understand each of the terms here and also understand the arguments. Can you see that big N is only function of big X? So I'll make that remark here. Big N only depends on big X. Similarly, omega naught is independent of time. I hope this part is understood to everyone. Anybody having difficulty? You see, what we have done is basically transform the integration from this omega to omega naught here. And the advantage is that omega naught is constant. It is not changing with time. Although omega is changing with time as the body deforms, that section will change with time. So the surface is going to change. The normal is going to change with time. But it's pre-image. That is omega naught here. That still remains the same. Okay. Now let us write this a bit more carefully. So this is omega naught into dead F into F inverse transpose into sorry, it is not before it is sigma times I'm sorry sigma into F inverse transpose. into big N D capital A. Okay. Can you see that it looks very much like sigma into N D A. It is looking like this. Except that now the N is the undeformed normal. This big N is the undeformed normal and you have D capital A and you are integrating over the undeformed surface. But the thing inside the bracket is a bit complicated, this thing. And this has got a name. This is called, this is denoted by P and it's called first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. stress tensor sorry okay as, as you see there is this first there is also a second pula kirchhoff stress tensor but let's forget about that okay and and then we can also denote attraction t big t which is equal to big P into big N and this is traction per unit undeformed area because you see this big T has to be multiplied with D capital A to get total force. See both are the expression of the same total force big F. This is also the same total force and this is also the same total force but in two different domains. Okay, so big T is P into capital N, that is traction, sorry, this is force per unit, not track per unit. So it is traction, but it is force per unit undeformed area. 
and therefore they also call Lagrangian traction. Sometimes you also call it Piola traction. Okay, whereas that small t that we have written, this small t, okay, there is no space, so I will write it here itself. So small t is sigma into small n. No? So this is force per unit deformed area. And that's so called Cauchy traction. Also notice that the small t and big T are in the same direction. but having different magnitude. Okay. In fact, this first PK stress tensor is also kind of mixed tensor. Why do we say it's mixed tensor? So I'll, I'll make it more clear now. You see that sigma, when you say this small t is equal to sigma times n. So sigma takes n, sigma acts on n and gives you t, right? So n is also the deformed normal and t is also the force in the deformed configuration. So therefore, sigma is a Eulerian stress tensor in true sense because the input and output both are Eulerian. Yes. So the sigma still remains a function of small x. So how are we uh, saying that we have converted it to Lagrangian configuration? Yes, sigma is still, but then small x you will write it as you know, like this, can you see here? So small x, you are writing this way. As a so that you can say, yes. Okay. Uh, sir? Yes. Sir, can you give the example in which case we use this Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor and in what case? This will be using Cauchy stress tensor. Um, okay, that's a very good question because people get, you know, always worried that it's just a theory. Will it be even used? So the, the usefulness will come later on. You know, for, I mean, 99% in finite deformation elasticity or large deformation solid mechanics problem, not just elasticity, even plasticity or viscoelasticity. For large deformation solid mechanics problem, 99% we use first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. Whereas in fluid mechanics, 99% we use Cauchy stress tensor. Because in fluid mechanics, we solve the problem in the current configuration. Whereas in solid mechanics, we try to solve the problem in the reference configuration. And that's why all the quantities involved automatically have to be Lagrangian quantities. Okay, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, isn't study of viscoelastic material is kind of mixed like both fluidic component, which are yes. viscous as well as elastic component are there? That is true. It is kind of mixed. Okay. So there will be the, the property of both kind. I mean, both the tensors will be involved there. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, there's one more doubt. You yeah. have told like small t and capital T are in the same direction, but having different magnitudes. So, sir, I couldn't understand like uh, are in the same direction because when we are defining capital T in small t, we are using capital N 
small m so can you explain that also anyway so I try to compare these two formulas um, maybe i use some other color yeah red color have a look at these two formulas so what is uh, common here can you see what is uh, in the first formula we have sigma into little n da whereas in the other formula we have we are writing at equal to big p into big n into d capital a that's the equivalence isn't it so sigma n d small a is equal to big p big capital n into d capital a but sigma into little n is the traction t cauchy traction t is into d small a whereas big p into big n is piola traction capital t into d capital a so from here you can see that a small t and big t have the same direction but the magnitude is not the same because d small a and d capital a are not the same okay sir yes, sir. yeah uh, hello sir yes uh, sir i had a doubt um, hello yeah, yeah please uh, sir um, about this lagrangian and euler description like we are applying here so yes. in reference in reference configuration uh, since like all the points are fixed so that's why we are telling it is in lagrangian uh, description right the reference configuration yeah i mean basically whenever it's a function of reference configuration if it's a function of points in the reference configuration then we call it a lagrangian description if and the quantity uh, involved depend on depend on reference configuration then we say it's lagrangian and and for uh, eulerian sir like uh, one of the things that we had learned is that like we see it in a current configuration but like at a at a fixed location like how, how many whatever particles are passing at a particular time t is that how we define euler is that how you define eulerian yes sir because then here we are uh, writing a small x vector but it corresponds to a particular capital x right that so is true we are not looking at the point in uh, body at a fixed time right we are still looking at one particle correct correct see when you so it's a very good question again when you say that small x when you start writing it as small x as a function of capital x and t then you are fixing a particle but when you write a small x as it is without involving its dependence then it's a spatial coordinate okay as it is it's a spatial coordinate but when you say small x as a function of big x and t then it becomes a then it means you are looking at a particle it's a lagrangian description but a small x as it is is a spatial coordinate eulerian so okay? here you had used yes. for a particular particle right in the beginning like with the cauchy stress tensor for cauchy stress tensor say again for cauchy stress tensor you wrote it as a function of small x vector and t yes. and then you told it for a particular particle right then you told it is small x is dependent on capital x comma t in second step yeah right yes. correct see that's because see okay very good so you see this step here first step here it's a fully eulerian description so sigma is a function of small x and t we are not saying whether a small x is a function of some big x we are not saying anything as right now okay so at a time we look at a 
spatial surface it's a although it's a section of the body but it can also be thought of as a surface in the space right this omega t yeah. this is all although a section of the body but it can be thought of as a surface in the space and then you are looking at different points in that surface small x but now you know it is not so it is everything is spatial but because it is corresponding to some deformation therefore it is possible to relate it to the reference configuration because it is corresponding to a physical deformation no so it is possible to relate it to a reference configuration and when we start talking about that then we say that okay at a given instant and at a point a small x in the surface whatever particle is present there it must be corresponding to some big x in the reference configuration right and yes. and therefore that's where we start writing this thing here you see here this thing okay, so when we write second step is also then uh, like a second step is not then the eulerian integration because then yeah we have yeah. transition it's a transition ah okay step. yes because you see still this omega t is there no this is fully lagrangian this is fully lagrangian because everything is now in terms of lagrangian but this is you know it is transition and um, this transitioning yes okay sir that's that that okay very good any more sorry sir yes uh, in, sir, in uh, is it possible that uh, in the solid mechanics what we are learning we have a deformation map so that we are uh, connecting the small x to capital x to convert yes. eulerian to lagrangian uh, correct but in uh, does, does the deformation map exist in fluid mechanics also of course it exists see in fact you know uh, the whole thing is that this continuum it's a continuum view point it's it's a continuum body both solid as well as fluid body are continuum bodies so yeah. it's just that the body is, is we say it's fluidic but the deformation map exists for both solid like bodies as well as fluid like bodies okay but so of I... course also I, i should say although i said it but in practical case practical situation it is very difficult to track a particle of the fluid So that's why we use uh, Eulerian in the fluid uh, mechanics. So I, I hope you got the idea about this Piola-Kirchhoff stress, right? It's a so as I was saying here, t is equal to sigma times n, oh, but t is equal to big T into capital N. Yes, tell me. Uh, sir, I have uh, uh, a doubt uh, in the expression of force. Uh, yes. Can you just uh, in the in the Lagrangian description that we have derived? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, in the uh, fully uh, where you have written fully Lagrangian, shouldn't we have yes. uh, sh shouldn't we have changed the fun uh, changed the function? So uh, so uh, since uh, we are writing small x in the form of capital X, shouldn't we have changed sigma to some other say p or some other oh, function variable? Yeah. of course you yes, we should change it so maybe i mean to be mathematically rigorous here we should call this sigma as some sigma hat so so you are right to be mathematically rigorous we should do that very good who was this guy vinay yes sir okay very good yes but i didn't want to bring it up because you know it makes things a bit complicated for people i mean i wanted to explain things without getting into too much of jargon okay anyway but that's what we should do technically yes uh, sir yes when we talk about omega not it is basically undeformed surface right yes 
So, sir, does that mean that there aren't any forces at this point or at this reference state? Of course, you see, in the reference configuration, there is no force acting. If it's a stress-free, there is no force acting in the reference configuration. And this force that we are talking about, this big F, it is yes, all sir. acting in the deformed configuration. You know, this is also a very common point of confusion among the students. They say, okay, is this when we do Lagrangian, does it mean that the force is acting in the reference configuration? No. It is not acting in the reference configuration. We are just trying to write it using reference coordinates. It doesn't mean it is acting in the reference configuration. The forces are still in the deformed configuration. We are just trying to express that using Lagrangian coordinates. No, it's just a transformation. It's just a way to find out that force. It's the same force, but just trying to find it using two different frameworks. OK, sir. Yeah. Uh, and sir, in our UG course, we have studied a stress tensor. Uh, so like, was it a Cauchy stress tensor? Yeah, it was a Cauchy stress tensor. Okay. Although you were doing solid mechanics, right? You did solid mechanics, still you used Cauchy stress tensor. You didn't talk of Piola Kirchhoff. Yes. So, sir. you know, the UG, it turns out that the the surface normal the leading to the leading order term the the deformed normal and undeformed normal are the same did you see the assignment the the third problem the the n d small a was equal to capital n d capital a plus extra term which were linear in u yes sir the leading order term was that small n d small a equal to capital n d capital a plus the terms so if you forget about those plus terms you see that small n d small a is same as capital n d capital a so then therefore you know for linear elasticity, sigma or t, it doesn't matter. They are all the same for linear elasticity. OK, sir. Yeah, that's also a very good question, yeah. I really want to give you a lot of assignments, but you guys are not so happy with me giving you assignments. But that's the way to learn. Sir, uh, the re we we take undeformed configuration as difference configuration just because we want uh, to remember like what was there before application of forces and all. Is it the only reason like we take stress-free configuration as our uh, uh, reference configuration for a study? See, you can take your reference configuration to be anything. Mm, yes, sir. But for convenience, usually we take it to be the one which is the stress-free configuration. And sometimes, you know, the stress-free configuration can be very crazy configuration. So in that case, you don't want to have such a crazy configuration as a reference configuration because you have to measure everything relative to reference configuration. See, all these strains, they're all measured relative to reference configuration. So it should also be a nice configuration. So you have to make that, you know, you have both two objective functions to maximize. One, you want a nice configuration, and then you also want a stress-free configuration. So, you know, it can be either of the two or in between also. OK, sir. But I mean, but theoretically, you can take any configuration to be the reference configuration. Okay, sir.